Welcome to the show. It's me, John Park, and you are here with me in my workshop. And that means it is time for John Park's workshop happening right now during the normal Ask an Engineer time slot. So we've made a little adjustment here, and I'm doing my show on Wednesdays for the uh, foreseeable future. But uh, Phil and Lamore are off doing their thing while I'm uh, doing this here on, on Wednesday nights. Uh, so I just got distracted because I realized I was playing some Galaga earlier and the uh, attract loop is running over there, but I guess I'll leave that. Sure, why not? Um, so all kinds of stuff going on here tonight, jam-packed show. Uh, the Let's see, what are we going to do? We're going to talk about uh, products. We're going to talk about shipping. We're going to talk about perks and free stuff if you order things. Uh, I've got a coupon code for you. Uh, what else? We'll go over the um, product pick of the week that I did this week. Uh, what else? We've got some uh, highlights from the Python on Hardware newsletter. Uh, I don't have a circuit Python Parsec for you today, so we'll be skipping that one, but I'll be back with that next week. Uh, what else? Jobs, Learn, our Discord. By the way, let me mention our Discord. If you're wondering where the chat is at, uh, you may be wondering. You may be over on Twitch or Facebook and you, you figure, well, some people are probably talking somewhere. Where is it? Where are they, where are they doing all that talking? Uh, the place to be is in our Discord chat. And you can get there by going to adafru.it slash Discord. That'll jump you over to our server. And then look for the live broadcast chat channel. Uh, we have a bunch of other channels too, but this is the one, uh, this is the one where most of the action is right now during a live stream. Uh, let's see. What else do we have going on? Uh, let me, let me start off with a show and tell recap. So we had a, uh, we had a show and tell earlier, uh, and we had a few people come on. Uh, we had, uh, Jay from DigiKey came on and he, uh, was showing a pretty cool gift he's making for someone for the holidays that is a uh, sort of a music box terrarium with rotating motorized gears and some lighting inside, all controlled with a Circuit Playground or Circuit Playground Express. I forget which one, if he said. Uh, you can always catch the recap, by the way. Just head to the YouTube channel, and uh, maybe after this show, if you, if you missed the show and tell and you want to go see it, uh, it's there. It's archived. Jeff Epler, our own Jepler, came on to show uh, a couple things. One is some uh, changes in the way some settings files are going to be saved on CircuitPython boards, which is uh, rather than using the .env or .env format, uh, we have now the uh, option to use TOML, uh, which is a markup language of some kind. Uh, and uh, there are some changes in that. It gives you some uh, ability to do some comments. There's just some uh, updates to how you're going to quote put quotes around strings, kind of requires quotes around strings, uh, and a few other things. So uh, go, and, go and check that out to see uh, some of, uh, of what Jeff was talking about there. I think Scott was working on this as well. Uh, Jeff also showed a Next mouse. So last week he was working on the Next keyboard, Next brand, N-E-X-T. -E uh, and now he's got the mouse, and the mouse is also funky, and you can't just plug it into a modern computer. Actually, I didn't see if he showed what the 
uh, what the connector is on that. I don't know what connector it has. Uh, it can plug into a Next computer currently. It can plug into a Next keyboard and then uh, route that through to the computer. And so he's going to make it run on CircuitPython-based hardware. So one, just reading the mouse on hardware uh, and writing out USB to your computer. And he also wants to work on uh, just having one CircuitPython device necessary if the mouse is plugged into the keyboard. And then both of those uh, data streams will be going through a uh, CircuitPython piece of hardware, which is pretty cool. Liz came on to show a project that she's been working on, which is taking the control voltage, which is used to change pitches in a Eurorack synthesizer, and quantize them, which means force them, no matter what weird semi-in-between notes might be coming over your control voltage, she's going to snap them into specific semitones, maybe even specific scales, like a major scale in a certain key, uh, just um, a bunch of possibilities there to clean up your act, clean up your, your control voltage, which can be flying all over the place and doing weird stuff. Uh, and she's hoping to even get to where she's using uh, four of these little quantizers on a Raspberry Pi Pico so she can do some polyphonic stuff, play multiple notes at once. Uh, what else? Joey came on from the community. Our good friend Joey Castillo came on to show his NeoPixel Christmas tree. Now, this is a, a cute little Christmas tree. Uh, he's decorated with NeoPixels. Okay, pretty good, pretty, uh, pretty attractive so far. But it's Joey, so he takes it a few steps further. Uh, first of all, I want it to be battery powered. Now that can consume a lot of uh, power. You can run through that pretty quickly if you leave them running all day. So he had to make himself a little control panel. He wanted to make a little control panel uh, that used a um, LCD feather wing, which he created, uh, his oddly specific, uh, oddly specific labs, I think is the company. I, 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 sorry, I can't remember right now. Um, he has a little feather wing. I can show it actually on our, on our site here in a second. We sell it. Uh, that he's using for the UI. It's an LCD, uh, kind of like, like this watch I'm wearing here. Uh, and a feather, and I forget what the other board was on it, but uh, he's got some buttons on there, and he can program a schedule. When do the lights come on and some other settings. Uh, let's say he's going to have it running for just four hours a day. He said he can get a week of battery out of it because the uh, scheduler will turn it off. He'll just run it for a few hours. And he's using the deep sleep. So deep sleep mode in CircuitPython allows it to draw, I think he said, just a milliamp uh, when it's asleep uh, and is just periodically checking to be woken up to, to, to check the alarm to see if it's time to turn on the lights. So uh, that was really cool. And... Uh, I'll, show, I'll show this later in a little more detail, but Joey took advantage of the new, a fairly new feature inside of Adafruit's um, user pages. So you can, as a, as a logged in user, you can create your own user page. Uh, and Joey had a user page learn guide. So you can go to the user page for Joey and you'll see uh, a learn guide on how to build this tree, which is pretty cool. Uh, so that was our show and tell. Let me take that uh, off of there, and uh, let me uh, give you uh, some updates on shipping things. So let me, let me pull up a web page here. How about maybe this one will do. Uh, so, in fact, if you go to adafruit.com, if you haven't been in a while, it's likely that you'll see this banner up top. Sometimes you can close that, and then I don't know how often it resets or if you can refresh to get that. But there's a little banner up top that says, hey, approaching holiday shipping deadline. Place all of your UPS three-day orders by 11 a.m. Eastern time on Friday. So you've got a couple days, December 16th. Uh, if you click that, I think that takes you to adafruit.com slash holiday. So you can always get here, even if you don't see the banner, just by clicking on that. Uh, or by knowing that the URL is adafruit.com slash holiday. Uh, and here's our general info about what holidays are, uh, are non-shipping holidays, non-shipping days. Uh, and then there's the specifics of holiday shipping deadlines for 2022. And you can see here we have blown past. Uh, just yesterday was the last day for uh, ground shipping by UPS. Uh, and then on Friday is the last day to do three-day orders uh, by UPS. Uh, Monday, that following Monday is... Uh, limit for two-day orders in order. This is all in order to get them before Christmas, uh, and then next day would be on December 20th. Is is the uh, the last time we can guarantee that. 
Uh, so don't forget, if you're thinking of uh, making some orders, that, that is, uh, those are your deadlines there. Uh, now, I also want to say we have a new freebie. So if you go to afruit.com slash free, you'll see the freebies that we have. And uh, this is a change. So if you place an order for 99 US dollars or more, you will get a free nude. Uh, and that is our little flexible, rubbery, noodly LED. Uh, and this is going to be a warm white, which is one of my favorites. It looks like a, you can use it for like Edison bulb-like things. Uh, looks, looks like a very natural uh, color, nice warm, warm white color. Uh, so yeah, this is a 130 millimeter long one. We have, a, I think, a couple lengths of these. This is the 130 millimeter long one. There's a, a positive and negative side to it. One of the little metal ends has a, has a mark in it that tells you it's the plus side. Uh, and you just connect three volts to it. Use a microcontroller to do that, so you can control it on and off. Uh, or you can just use a, uh, a lithium watch battery is another way to do it. Uh, so the, yeah, that's the $99 perk right there. You get uh, a free nude. Uh, if you go to the $150 or $149 or more, you get a, I believe these stacks. So you'll get the nude and you'll get a KB2040 uh, keyboard, which is a great little microcontroller. Perfect for your keyboard types of projects, macro pad projects. Um, projects that require a lot of GPIO, you can use CircuitPython and Arduino on it. They're great little boards. I love them. In fact, I'm using one in the project uh, that we'll be looking at a little later today. If you go over $200 or more, you'll get free UPS ground shipping. Uh, you probably don't want to use that right now, though, if you're trying to get it before Christmas, because uh, I think you'll need to do the three-day to get, uh, get it in time. And on orders of $299 or more, you will get a free Circuit Playground Blue Fruit uh, BLE. And uh, this says right here, how many freebies can I get? All of them. Uh, so you'll, you'll stack up those freebies if you, if you order stuff. And um, one thing I like to do when I encourage you to, to check out cool stuff that you can get in the store is make it a little bit cheaper for you. So this week's or today's rather coupon code, it's not good for the whole week. It's just good for, for this show uh, today. You should, use it before the end of the show or, or a little bit into the uh, later evening, but Blingy, B-L-I-N-G-Y, Blingy will get you 10% off in the Adafruit store, and that uh, is for anything you can buy other than subscriptions, software, and gift certificates. So uh, get real stuff, real physical things, and you will get 10% off. There's a little, uh, when you're checking out, there's a little coupon code slot to go fill that in and, uh, and get your discount. Uh, let's see. While I'm, uh, while I'm on that hype train right there, let's, uh, I will show you. Here's, here's what that, uh, that nude, if you just type in nudes, N-O-O-D-S is how we decided to spell that. Uh, you'll see, here's the little warm white, uh, flexible 130 millimeter lit up. It's beautiful. Um, so you can, you can do some nice effects with those. Uh, and that's your, that's your $99 freebie right there. All right, uh, let me get myself a sip of water and uh, then I'll mention we've got our jobs board. Uh, so if you're looking for work or if you're looking to hire someone, you want to head on over to jobs.adafruit.com. And uh, that is entirely free to use, both if you're looking for work or if you're looking to hire someone. Uh, there haven't been many new positions posted in here. I'm I'm wondering if that's because we vet them all, and the people who usually vet them are busy right now. So um, we might uh, we might see more new uh, postings later, or it might be just that time of year. Right? Most people don't want to hire people or or change jobs this time of year. But uh, here you can see going back uh, a bunch of the positions that were here. You can always get in touch with someone. Uh, click on their link and uh, find out more. And this represents all kinds of work: remote work. Uh, on-site work, freelance work, contract work, part-time, full-time. Uh, it's all possible and all available there at jobs.adafruit.com. So go check that out. All right. Uh, I mentioned, let's see. Yeah, well, you know what? We'll get to Joey's. When we go and look at, uh, at the uh, Python on Hardware newsletter, I think, I'll, I'll, trans I'll segue from that into Joey's user page guide because that's really cool. Um, 
All right, so next up, I'll mention I've got uh, that show right there that happened yesterday. That's my Tuesday show, JP's Product Pick of the Week. And on the show, I like to pick a new product of ours, sometimes an oldie but goodie. This was a brand spanking new product this week. Uh, Give you a huge 50% off discount on it. We stash a bunch of them in the back before the show so that we can uh, make sure we have some in stock. We had about 100 of them in stock yesterday. Sold through like hotcakes. Uh, It's a cool item and is uh, half price, so you can't lose. Uh, And I'll do some demos of it, show some software, show some hardware. Uh, And then I like to reduce it down to a little bite-sized version, which I'm going to show you right now. This is my product pick of the week this week. It is the 5x5 NeoPixel BFF, best friend forever for cutie pies and Zhao boards. Is a set of 25 little teeny teeny NeoPixels, RGB LEDs, that are individually addressable. When you connect this to the cutie pie, what you're doing is you're connecting up power, ground, and a data line, which is on pin A3 by default. You can send it commands using the NeoPixel library inside of Arduino or in CircuitPython. And I'm using some headers here, header pins and sockets, to plug it into my little cutie pie. Unplug that. I'll take off that uh, diffusion shield. So there you can see we've got little sockets I put on there, uh, little pins I put on there. It is the 5x5 NeoPixel BFF for cutie pie and Zhao boards. Hey, that was just ready to loop, wasn't it? Uh, So I was just checking out the Discord while that was running there and uh, had some questions and comments. Uh, Osterly said, I I want this track. Is it on SoundCloud? I don't think it is, but I'll put it up, I I think, on my Bandcamp, um, the track that played at the beginning of the show. Uh, Other question I saw. And by the way, you can uh, can post questions here during the show. I'll try to check them out. I'm easily distractible, but I'll try to check them out. Uh, And I'll also... Check them at the end of the show if you can uh, throw some questions in. Then I'll take a look. Uh, there was there was a uh, there was a good joke on here too. I don't know what spurred it on, but uh, where'd it go? This is worth. Gordy G says a photon checks into a hotel and the concierge asks if he has any lug- luggage. He says no, I'm traveling light. <laughs> good one. Uh, Good. Yeah. So ask ask your questions uh, later later on, and I'll uh, I'll be sure to get to them uh, if I know the answer. If not, I'll I'll do my best to direct you towards a good answer. Uh, let's see what else. So uh, hey, this right here, Circuit Python, is quite quite famously also known as Code Plus Community, and uh, one of the ways that we like to celebrate that is through our Python on Hardware newsletter. So if you uh, head on over to Adafruit Daily, you can subscribe to the Python on Hardware newsletter. Uh, And this gives you a glimpse into sort of the weekly happenings in the wide world of Python running on hardware. Uh, Generally, we mean hardware that isn't a general purpose computer, but more single board computers and uh, microcontrollers. Uh, But sometimes it's just general Python stuff. And these are things, some of them are Adafruit uh, people, some of them are out in the community, so it's a mix. Uh, And I like to give you a few highlights from this, but first I'll say, go and subscribe if you're into this, if you like this kind of stuff. Head to adafruitdaily.com and you can subscribe. Uh, All you need is to put in your email address. We vow to never ever spam you or sell it to bad people or do anything terrible with it. Uh, You can uh, cancel at any time if you get tired of getting something in your mailbox. Um, There's a little subscribe here link right there. So the the first one I'll mention is this right here, the uh, CircuitPython 8.0.0 Beta 5 has been released. Uh, And a few notable things in this is the Wi-Fi on Pico W Uh, has been added to this release. Also, uh, the Wi-Fi workflow in general, so being able to uh, get to the contents of your CircuitPython board that has Wi-Fi built in uh, remotely from a browser as well as um, 
putting files on it, editing files, saving, and all that. that all that workflow has been uh, getting a lot of attention and is in this release. Uh, also, another one that I saw that looks really interesting I'd like to check out is bulk analog I.O. input, um, which sounds like, and maybe someone uh, can, can tell me this, is analog buff I.O. available on RP2040 chips, which sounds like something that would speed up uh, reading multiple analog inputs, multiple ADC pins, uh, which, which could be great for, uh, for a lot of the types of projects I like to do that have lots of knobs on them. So I'm curious about that one. Uh, and let's see, scrolling on, so you can see there's a, there's a bunch of notes here about what came in, uh, in that beta of, ADA of 8, not ADA, of 8.0.0 beta 5. Uh, another uh, piece of news in here was there are updates to the Raspberry Pi supply chain, uh, which has been uh, difficult to get, as, as a lot of you know. Um, and they have announced that they're going to be getting a lot out to retailers uh, soon. Uh, the availability in retail channels should be improving a lot in the beginning of the new year. And by the second half of 2023, they think they're going to be bringing back significant stock. So um, if you can hold out a little longer, don't pay scalper prices for your Raspberry Pi. Uh, wait and, and you should be uh, rewarded. Uh, another interesting uh, link on here. So a lot of these are, are long reads that you can go and click on and check out. Uh, and I've seen info about this. There are a few different synthesizers in Korg's uh, recent lineup. I think the uh, Op6 and the Wave State, and maybe one other. Uh, they're all a similar hardware architecture. And internally, they're running on essentially a Raspberry Pi compute module. So there's an there's a, uh, article on this that you can go check out to learn more about uh, how they are using the Raspberry Pi inside of uh, those Korg synths. Uh, hey, I mentioned this, right? Joey's uh, tutorial page for uh, the Christmas lights on his user page. Uh, here's here's a info about it. So if you didn't watch Show and Tell today, but you did subscribe to the Python on Hardware newsletter, you would have known about it. Uh, and if you did both, you know twice as much. And now I'm talking about it. And it's really just going to fold in on itself like a fractal eating a fractal. Um, I got excited there. But yeah, uh, there's a link to his Mastodon post about that here, and there's a link to his user page, which I'll, I'll uh, go to right after this. Uh, some other interesting stuff that I saw in here, a project that we posted, which is this uh, weather station project of the week. Uh, and thanks again to Anne, by the way, who, who heads up the, uh, the production of this newsletter. It's a Massive task every week, and uh, it's really great to have all of this news coming from so many sources uh, brought together in one place. And uh, she found this one here, also on Mastodon. This is a uh, rainbow weather project that was ported from a ESP8266 over to a Raspberry Pi Pico, and it's using CircuitPython. And it has this really nice uh, acrylic uh, LED light pipe type of display on it to give you information about uh, what the weather is. Uh, here was another really cool project that, uh, let me see, I'm going to grab a link to this one that I put over here somewhere. Uh, this is Kevin MacLear who created a Guitar Hero game using the Pimeroni Galactic Unicorn, which is a big uh, PCB with uh, a bazillion uh, LEDs. I'm not sure how many, but lots and lots of LEDs on it. Uh, uh, RGB LEDs on it, and this is running MicroPython on a Pico W, uh, and this is a type of rhythm game that you can play using a uh, set of buttons down at the bottom. If you go uh, follow the links that are in the newsletter, uh, you'll arrive here eventually, and then you'll accept some cookies probably like I do. Uh, and he's got a really nice write-up about the build. There's a YouTube video that shows it in action and information about how it's put together. Uh, so yeah, it's a fi 583 RGB LEDs. It's a 53 by 11 grid, and those are bonkers numbers. Why 53 and why 11? I'm sure there's a good reason, but those, those make me itch. Uh, and uh, you can, yeah, you can take a look here. There's also a really cool silk screen that they did on the back there with this epic artwork, as they say. They're totally right. Uh, so that's a, a rhythm game, Guitar Hero style rhythm game where you have lanes of notes coming and you have to play them in time. Very cool uh, 
also found out about that thanks to the, uh, the newsletter. And uh, let's see, Mark Gambler wrote up, uh, Mark is a, a frequent visitor to our shows and tells, uh, he wrote up the uh, Christmas display that he has made from NeoPixel strips here. So you can uh, find a link there to go over to Hackster.io to find out more about it. Uh, and one other that I blew past that I got to go back up to because this thing looks amazing. Uh, this is a Unicode input device. So if you're tired of having real normal keys and typing at moderately fast speeds and you want to slow things way the heck down, uh, this is a series of toggle switches that you use to select a Unicode by, uh, for, for a character or an emoji, and then you press the one uh, button on there to send the whole thing. It's wild, uh, really something else. Uh, and that build is available on Hackaday, so you can go check that out. Uh, and then the last thing on here, this is kind of fascinating. I saw... Uh, info about a project, this is kind of a, a, mostly a Python project more than a hardware project, but it does involve hardware, uh, just not the typical microcontrollers that we're using. This right here, first of all, NTSC test pattern caught my attention. Uh, this is a project called VHS Decode, and this is a software-defined videotape player. So what this is, is software that you can hook up a VCR, and they, they support uh, beta and VHS and super VHS and one other, I think, uh, through an RF, uh, I think it's RF decoding box, and it can, through the, the software defined part of it means it does not decode the video, it actually captures it raw, and then you can use the software to decode it the way you want. One example of why this matters, uh, they're very typically in broadcast uh, captures, when, pe when people record off of broadcast TV, especially old archives, uh, there's a vertical blanking area above where the picture tube uh, makes your, your picture visible that can contain data. And often that's where data for things like subtitles was contained. Um, uh, also time code, if it's, if it's a type of tape that had time code on it. So you'd never get that if you used a regular old capture card. This VHS decode project will allow you to do fancy things like that, uh, as, as well as uh, just the, uh, the, the bizarre types of um, data arrangements that come off of the diagonal spinning drums of, of the, the tape players. Uh, this, this project aims, is open source and aims to, to handle a lot of these um, archiving projects for, for VHS and other types of videotapes. So super cool. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what I have to say about the... Uh, the Python on hardware newsletter. Really, really great uh, issue. Thanks so much for everyone who's, who's involved with putting that together. Uh, all right, let's see. How about, uh, I, I promised I would segue over to Joey's user page. So what I'm gonna do is actually, I'm gonna scroll back up here uh, to the link. Did I pass it? And I'm just going to click on that. So here you can see this is Joey's uh, user page. And so everyone who has a, an account, a free account on Adafruit, you don't have to pay anything, but just having, having a login uh, with your uh, email and password set up, log in, uh, you have a user page. And in fact, there's a learn guide on how to set up your user page, uh, some, some ways you may want to use it. Uh, and one of the features, one of the newer features, is the ability to create learn guides right on your user page. So uh, this is the one that Joey was talking about during the show and tell. Here you can see his NeoPixel Christmas tree with deep sleep and LCD Featherwing. So this was all created uh, right in the user page. So you get a, uh, a version essentially of the same uh, uh, methods that we use for creating learn guides and the ability to share them out to the world right here in your, in your user page. So. You can see it looks an awful lot like, uh, like a regular old learn guide. You've got the uh, products that were used and parts. A little gif there on assembling uh, the, the feather wings. Uh, there's the feather tripler that's used. Um, and, oh, it's the prop feather wing. Yeah, okay, so the prop feather wing was the, someone had a question in the, in the Discord earlier about uh, what was the third wing. So this one's using, uh, looks like a, 
let me, let me scroll up here. I don't get it wrong. Yeah, ESP32 S2 feather. Uh, then the prop maker feather wing, which is a really good one for, for controlling the NeoPixels. Uh, and then the oddly specific objects, not labs, objects. Sorry, Joe. Oddly specific objects, LCD uh, feather wing there. Code, Adafruit IO setup, so you can use it uh, on the web. And then a really nice uh, flow graph of the user interface for setting your uh, schedule for your, for your lights to go on and off. Uh, and... Some tips on decorating the tree. There's the beautiful, uh, beautiful little LCD in action there. Uh, and he also has some inf info on measuring the uh, current consumption. I think that goes into the second page or second guide. Uh, so that's a really cool one. And uh, it's not your, not your regular average learn guide. I didn't include it in that section because it's right, right in a user page. This is super cool. Uh, oh, my, well, I got to grab a window that just decided to fly across the screen. <laughs> there we go. Uh, but that's a, I think that's a decent segue for talking about learn guides. So uh, I'm going to jump into, let's see, I got a different page up for that. There it is. I'm gonna jump into learn guides and talk about new learn guides this week. So uh, if I click on the little view all link next to new guides, you can see uh, we have four that we're going to talk about here today. One is uh, this iBook iPad case from the Ruiz brothers. Really cool project. They have a nice video there to show it in action. Uh, this uses a gutted iBook G3, which was uh, sometimes referred to as the toilet seat. Can't imagine why. Uh, so they bought one of these on eBay for about 150 bucks. Probably non-working. You don't need it to be working because uh, you're actually gutting it. It's non-destructive, so if you're careful, save all the screws, take all the parts out. Uh, all this does is... Uh, reassembles the shell and uh, with, I think, four or six Torx screws and uses a couple of 3D printed inserts to be able to perfectly snap in a wireless keyboard and an iPad Pro. Uh, so now this becomes a, an, a really nice iPad case that has amazing storage uh, or, or carry handle on there. Look at that thing. Really, really cool. Uh, I feel like at some point someone made a purse out of one of these or a couple of them with some, some, something in the middle there. Looks like a purse, right? Uh, so check out that guide. It'll tell, tell you how to uh, go find a donor uh, iPad on eBay or elsewhere, what you're looking for, or rather the iBook, uh, and uh, all the files you need to 3D print, put that together, and uh, use the little wireless keyboard with your iPad. Very nice. Uh, next, there's a guide by Liz on the iSpy Breakout. I love this thing. I, I made this one of my product picks of the week a few weeks ago, uh, and this will... Uh, this guide will take you through all of the pinouts, how to set it up, how to use it, some code examples, uh, running your display on CircuitPython, uh, Python, and Arduino. And this, uh, actually, if you check out the, uh, the pinout page here, this is nice because there's a lot of pins on here, uh, which is one of the reasons it's rules, because you don't have to wire all that on a breadboard or a perm proto anymore. You can just use that one lovely little cable, uh, little flat ribbon cable, bloop, right into here and then into your board. Uh, or rather into your display. Um, but it's a lot more than just display. So you see here it says we've got the, the power pins, uh, V in and ground. We have I squared C on here. So if you have something happening I squared C wise over on the board that has your display, uh, this will allow you to connect to that. All the SPI pins that are usually used for the display as well as the um, SD card. If you have an SD card uh, breakout or reader rather on the on the display and a lot of our displays have those uh, in fact here's one that I showed last week so you can see here's a nice big TFT and it's got the iSpy uh, ribbon plug right there and it has an SD card right over there sorry my, my monitor's backwards um, all that travels over that ribbon cable so you don't need to do do a bunch of hand wiring oh, there's a couple GPIO pins if there's buttons and things you want to use on the other side uh, chip, se chip select, backlight, uh, and a couple others, busy and int, which are not often used, but some, in some cases you need those. Uh, so thanks, Liz, for putting that guide together. Those are great little breakout boards. Uh, there was an update to the working with multiple same address I squared C devices guide by Carter, Carter Nelson. 
Uh, I actually don't know what the updates are. Sorry, I, I, I wish there were a diff or something that told me. Actually, I, kinda, I can kind of go into the history of it, but uh, I don't know what changed on this. One, one thing is that we have a, a newer board, I think, since this was made uh, for, for multiplexing this, uh, which I've shown. I have one right here, in fact. This is one of our, one of our multiplexing boards that lets you plug in a bunch of this, the same address uh, I squared C devices, and this will round robin through them and, and uh, get data. Uh, so that's a guide to go check out that's got an update to it. Uh, and then the last one, another new guide, is this uh, MOSFET driver breakout board. And Liz did a guide on this. So this is great. This is essentially uh, a little teeny tiny breakout that you plug a three pin JST, um, is it three or is it two? Three, yeah, three pin JST. Uh, over to your um, microcontroller, and that will uh, connect those up to power ground and uh, a data pin. And you essentially write, just like you blink an LED, you write a digital output to this thing over that JST, uh, and it has a MOSFET transistor in there, as well as a diode to prevent problems from spiking current. Uh, That often happens when you turn on and off big noisy DC motors and solenoids. Uh, maybe even relays. So this is a really cool breakout when you want to do that classic thing that people always had a question about. Hey, I've got my microcontroller. Can I plug a little fan into it or a little DC motor into it? Usually not. Usually you don't have the current to do that. You don't have the oomph. Uh, This little guy gives you that oomph. Uh, Also has really nice um, connectors, these these, uh, push fit connectors for the wiring of the motor that you're driving. Uh, And Liz did a really great little set of... uh, animated GIFs. I don't know how well they'll play play here when I hover over them. Uh, here, plugging into the terminal block. So you can see there's this uh, series of GIFs showing you use a screwdriver or something to press down uh, on the little clip that releases the pressure on the spring clamp and then it clamps the wire in place. Just do that on both sides. Reverse the procedure to get them out. Uh, and these are great. We had these on the bonsai uh, bonsai board, which was similar in some ways. It was a pump driver for uh, the clue for watering your plants. Uh, and this is uh, an even smaller, cheaper, cool little breakout. Uh, and as long as you can blink an LED, you can, you can run this thing. Liz has uh, examples in CircuitPython and in Arduino for using that. Uh, and those are your new guides. Right there. That was them. Uh, going to check my Discord to see if anyone has anything to say about that. No questions? Any thoughts about uh, what changed in Carter's guide? I'd love to know. Sorry, Carter. I don't know. I don't know what changed. I bet it was that, including the new boards. I'll pretend it was that. Uh, Okay, let's see what else is happening here today. Uh, I could talk about my project. Um, Yeah, I'll talk about my project and then we'll do some new products. Don't let me forget new products. Um, I will remind you though that I've got a coupon code for today's show and that is that right there, blingy. Uh, and why that will come clear later, but uh, Blingy is your coupon code. That'll give you 10% off in the store. So if you're getting any of that cool stuff, make sure you remember to, uh, to add that coupon code on the way out. You'll get your 10% discount. All right. Um, hey. Okay, so why don't I... Why don't I uh, head on over to the workbench and I'll show you the, uh, I had huge, huge project, uh, progress rather on my uh, 808 style drum trigger sequencer project. So that's it right there. Uh, You can see it. Uh, Similar to what I showed last week, except I've added a display. Uh, I've added a power uh, or rather a play, pause play button. You can see that little yellow uh, smaller button in the upper right corner there. Uh, the display is the 14 segment uh, 
I squared C breakout with stem QT. Uh, and then you can see I've also got a uh, rotary encoder on there. So this is nice. This gives me some, some input I can work with. I've got the rotary encoder for making some selections. I can click the encoder wheel to switch between a couple of uh, input modes for, for settings. And I've got a start stop button there. And I actually still have one GPIO pin left. So I, I of course, could add more I2C stuff. I want to kind of contain it. Uh, but I do have one, one left, uh, one GPIO left. Uh, and the way this is working, a uh, quick recap is that I've got the KB2040. Into it, I've plugged over the Stemma QT cable on I2C uh, the uh, constant current LED driver. So all 16 of the LEDs there. Uh, can be faded up and down from a minimum to a maximum value, brightness value, uh, using that breakout over I squared C, which means I have freed up 16 pins to use for I.O. So all of those uh, little clicky buttons are acting as normally open switches, just running directly into the KB2040 uh, has about mm, 18, 19 pins, something like that. So, uh, so I'm using a bunch of those, using 16 of those. I still have uh, the uh, <clears throat> play button to, to plug in, and like I said, I've got a, a, a spare. Uh, and then the, yes, yeah, since I'm using I2C, I've chained together the uh, constant current LED driver as well as the display, the 14 segment display, and then the uh, rotary encoder. It's also over I2C. So last week, this was just acting as essentially a MIDI keyboard. Uh, and I had assigned each button one of the MIDI notes that's used in a thing called General MIDI uh, to play drum kits. So every other MIDI channel you can send over will just play notes uh, into whatever you tell it to. It'll, it'll send chromatic notes. Uh, this is the special channel, channel 10. If you send it to a device or a software synth that's expecting it, uh, it plays different sounds per key. So it's got a uh, bass drum, analog bass drum, a kick drum, three flavors of floor toms, three flavors of stand toms, and on and on. It goes, I think, from note 31 to 80 or something like that. So there's a bunch of these keys. Uh, and so even like a sound blaster, if you think of something like an old sound blaster card, if you wanted to, you could send it uh, notes over channel 10 MIDI channel 10, and it would say, okay, I'm not playing piano stuff anymore. I'm not playing chromatic notes. I am playing different drum samples or, or synth, uh, synthesized drums, depending on what you're using uh, on those. Which means now instead of me pressing and playing this kind of like a little piano or a, a, a drum pad, I decide to set up 11 different drum voices. So right now you can see it says bass on there. Uh, that is gonna send bass drum or kick drum sounds uh, and I have it running at a certain beats per minute. So it's going to go through these four uh, beats each, each. So it's four beats in a measure. This is one measure, and each is subdivided into 16th notes. So it's one iana, two iana, three iana, four iana, and loops on and on. Uh, I can press those down and decide where am I hitting the kick drum or the bass. Switch over to the snare. Where am I hitting the snare? So let me go over there and demonstrate this to you so, so it makes more sense with... Uh, with some sound. Uh, let me just find a camera over there and I'm gonna turn off the fan there. That'll take a second for that to, to stop. Uh, I'll leave that on, sure, why not? So what I have running right now is actually a, um, a laptop running GarageBand and GarageBand, uh, you can pick a bazillion different nicely sampled, I don't know if they're synthesizing stuff, but nicely sampled, multi-sampled instruments that have been carefully tuned and designed. And they've got slew of different drum kits in there. So what I've done is I've picked a drum kit and then the fact that I'm sending uh, to a drum kit means it's gonna do this, this, this drum thing where there's different, different drums, not pitch drums. Um, so I think I have it set up right now where it's only gonna play this, this kick drum. So. I'll hit play. So I can go ahead, it's running, and I had to crank my uh, exposure so this little display wouldn't flicker on camera. Uh, it means these are kind of blown out, but hopefully you can see, 
I've got three notes that are lit up and I have a little blinky that's traveling to show me where we are in the, in the measure, where we are in time. Right, so there I just added another note. Okay, so that's, that's the bass drum. Now, with my little rotary encoder here, I can switch over to the snare track. And what you'll notice is these lights are gonna change because I'm not playing the snare drum on the same beats or the same steps. Uh, so now you can see this, this bass was on step uh, one, nine, and 11. And now I've got snares on five and what, uh, 12? No, 13, five and 13. Um, you're not hearing them right now just because I've, I've mixed them out of here. Uh, when I turn those on, it's actually also gonna play one of the other ones. I think I've got the clap uh, drum that's playing in that. So this is the snare. And let me go find uh, where that clap drum is. I'm gonna turn that off. And I can go back over to my snare. Someone else is playing right here. It's the clave. <laughs> I had the clave going there too. Uh, this is just because this mixer inside of GarageBand gangs together some of the drums in the kit, so I can't uh, mix each one on its own. Um, so let me uh, bring back some of those. And now I'm gonna turn it all on, just so you can hear the full kit. Let me see if I can get it to compress. So I have the compressor. It does not. All right, let me turn some of these down. Now I can slow this way down. If I click my rotary encoder, uh, you can see the beats per minute that we're running at, and now I can just simply change that. Let's slow it way down. Totally different feel. Uh, and now we can go in and start changing some drums. So I'll leave them all playing. So every time I click this, I'm just going between my beats per minute tempo and the uh, voice or drum track choice. So let's turn off. Let's turn off a bunch of stuff and just build it from scratch. All right, so now I've just got that kick, snare, snare, kick, 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 snare, kick, kick. Uh, and then I can throw in like these little tom, I like these little toms, I can do like a high, medium, low. You don't need to fill it all out, but I always love to throw in a bunch of closed hi-hat. And open that hat. And there's the start stop. So uh, what I'll do is I'll actually reset this and I have one pattern stored in here. Uh, and that's the sort of default pattern it's gonna play on startup. Uh, I don't have, uh, I'm gonna put some descriptive text here at the beginning, but right now I know that it's restarted because it's back to 120 BPM and it's, and it's, it's switched over to showing that. Uh, so here's the, the track as it's stored in software. And we go fast. Real fast. That symbol is real annoying. Let me get that out of there. Faster.
All right, if I go faster, it's just gonna start smoking. All right, <laughs> we'll stop there. Uh, so, by the way, just because I was, sorry, I was talking about this software but not showing it, uh, doesn't look like much. This is just GarageBand open with one, this is the Roland TR-808 um, drum pack that they have, comes free, uh, that I was running it through, and then these were the um, uh, mixer controls that I was doing. Uh, I'll show you actually, so I'm gonna leave, leave that open, and uh, let's bring this back to something a little more reasonable um, speed-wise. Uh, and what have I done? Have I broken something? Let me restart. Um, the one of the cool things, really cool things in here is, is you've got all these great drum drum sounds, uh, drum packs in here. Uh, you can basically switch to them while you're playing. And it doesn't have to be electronic kits. You can go much more rock, rock types of kit. So somehow I've never really played much with GarageBand and now I'm uh, totally enamored of the great sounds it's got in there. Show something else. Uh, I had it running also on my iPad, um, but one note, I, um, let me see if I can switch cameras out here. Uh, one thing that I still want to look into is can I prevent this from uh, lighting up all 16 LEDs at full brightness on startup? I'm running through a powered USB hub uh, just because the current draw is uh, right on the edge of what my USB wants to deliver. I didn't have too many problems with it, but then when I tried it on the iPad, I think it was, uh, it was unhappy about that. So just to be overly cautious, I think I can run it on the laptop here without that. But uh, on my iPad, I needed more juice, I think, than it, than it wanted to supply. Um, so that's one thing I wanna, wanna mess around with. And uh, another thing that I think what I'll, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write up a guide on this, uh, and I think I'm leave it on the breadboard. Uh, you could switch this over to three perma protos, but I'm gonna leave this pretty much as is. I might, uh, might neaten up, give this a, give this a home. Uh, one note, when you use these um, Stemma QT I squared C breakouts, you don't have an easy way to hook them to your breadboard because you didn't solder any pins on. Uh, it's totally fine to solder them on just as a mechanical um, connection. So I may solder pins on there, find a little spare spot on here, uh, press that down into the board so that it's got a permanent home. Same with uh, this um, display. This display has some pins on it. Actually, I never cut the display pins, but it has uh, headers there for, for soldering in pins uh, so that you can just stick it to the board. Uh, this, by the way, just using a little uh, photo filter, uh, light filter to make that, uh, that display much more legible. These don't look good on camera, or even in real life for, for that matter, uh, in bright light, uh, because the unlit ones show up really, really brightly. So I like to use a little piece of photo filter uh, on there to make that look nice. The old alarm clock trick, that was what I call that. So uh, let's see, what I wanna do is, oh, and I'll mention one other thing, and then I'll show you, show you code on this. The other thing that I want to do um, is add or just guide people in the um, guide towards possibly adding some features that they'll really like. And, and one that I think people will really like is the ability to store patterns. Uh, just to get the guide out before the end of the year, I think I'm gonna skip that. Maybe I'll add it later, but I think, I think as it is, it's pretty usable. Uh, and it's really about experimenting with patterns and playing with them. You can see very clearly on it what, what each uh, drum kit is doing on every step, which is good. Um, the um, ability to save your own patterns, though, would be really cool. And this was inspired by Toddbot's Pico Step Sequencer, 
um, which I think is inside now, I don't have one out here, uh, which has the ability to save to flash uh, patterns. So you can hold a, a key combo and save the current pattern, which would be kind of nice to add, but I don't think I want to go and do all that, <laughs> at least not right now. Uh, but you could add to this UI to where you can have A and B versions of a pattern. You can uh, you could potentially change it from uh, 16 to 32 steps if you wanted to. Uh, you could probably do mismatched track steps to do Euclidean rhythms. Uh, all of those kinds of things I think would work great. It's just an exercise in, in software. But uh, this platform here, this little breadboardy platform, I think is a, is a good one for step sequencer stuff. So what I'll do is unplug that and bring it over to my workstation here and show you the code, show you what, what makes this thing tick now. Uh, so I'm gonna switch cameras up. Oh good, Todd put a, uh, a link in the Discord to his Pico Step Sequencer. Uh, so he's got all the, all the great features in there that he's written for, uh, for doing things like storing sequences, uh, having, you could have multiple default sequences to, to begin with and pick between the sequences um, using the little rotary encoder and just toggling between choice uh, modes is, is a really easy to use and easy to add to type of interface. Uh, so let me plug this in and switch to this view of the world. And I'll open up my code here. Yeah, some people in the comments also said that uh, using some LED diffusion plastic um, might work for, uh, for making that LCD easier to look at. I find that fuzzes it out. It's just thick enough, unless, unless we found a source for much thinner. Um, that, that fuzzes it out like crazy. So just a Lee filter or, or um, what's the other uh, Theater One Roscoe? If you, if you buy a filter book, like Swatch book from Amazon, it'll give you like 300 filters and you can just cut out little pieces of them. It's meant for you to, you know, figure out your lighting and then go buy full sheets of gels for, uh, for theater lighting or, or uh, stage lighting. Um, but you can get a little, little swatch of them, swatch book of them, and uh, have plenty on hand for these types of projects. So here is what's going on. So I've got a bunch of libraries that I'm bringing in here to start with. Uh, some key ones is I'm using Supervisor, which allows me to use the ticks uh, rather than time, uh, or rather than, um, what's the name of the, uh, I've already forgotten, the other, uh, Time Monotonic, yeah. From the Time Library, there's Monotonic. This, this is more accurate, so I'm using the ticks uh, milliseconds, uh, I think it is, ticks milliseconds, uh, for counting, we'll see that later. Uh, I got my AW9523, that is the... Um, uh, constant current driver for the 16 LEDs. I've got uh, Adafruit MIDI. I'm actually experimenting. I was running into something that now I'm I'm questioning my. Wow, that was loud. Uh, I'm questioning my sanity a little bit on this. Let me turn this guy's volume off. Boop. Um, I was having some timing issues, and then I switched away from the Adafruit MIDI, which is a little more overhead, just to straight USB MIDI. It just isn't as pretty to look at, and the problem seemed to go away, but now I'm not having the problem at all. I, I set up a switch here, though. I can try the two different MIDI library approaches, um, so, so stay tuned. Uh, I'll see how that shakes out. You've got a couple of options of how you can uh, do your, your MIDI library. Um, bringing in the bouncer and uh, Adafruit Seesaw so that I can use the rotary encoder, all those switches without any problems. And then the HT16K33 is the 14-segment uh, display there. And look how nice that looks now that I've got it close up under this camera. Uh, and it's great compared to a seven segment display. You can't write snar for a snare. You can't write snar. I guess you kind of could, but uh, can you type this? Can you type clav? I don't think so. There's not a good V without a diagonal. And it's even got upper and lowercase. Clap, hand claps. Cowbell. How are you going to make a W on a, on a seven-segment display? You're going to use up two, two slots for that. It would just be cow, which is fine. But Anyway, I really like this 14-segment display. Uh, then I'm setting up my 
uh, I squared C bus there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So here's where we get into some of the sequencer guts. Uh, I have a variable here called number of steps. And I could probably, uh, I don't know, name that differently because it's not necessarily the steps in the sequence. Uh, we have a separate sequence length here that's set to 16, but it's pretty common on drum sequencers to be able to set like a 32 or a 64 step pattern. So you get like two or four measures, not just one, which is pretty repetitive. Um, still using just 16 physical buttons and LEDs, but you'll run through the first measure and then whoop, the second measure comes on, third, fourth, and then back to the first. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll name this num, num switches. Uh, number of drums. So this is how many voice channels I have. And that this uh, mimics an 808. I've got uh, kick, snare, the three toms, the clave or maraca, the hand clap or whatever that also is, the, ha the cowbell, open hat, closed hat, symbol. Um, you could make this anything you want. Uh, you may at some point reach uh, limits of sending your MIDI uh, accurately uh, if you have too many things happening all at once, but it seemed to handle 11 without too many problems. Uh, I've got a default BPM, so this BPM variable is just why you see it say 120 when we start. Uh, and then I have some math here for uh, deriving the uh, timing of a step based on what my BPM is. Uh, since we can change that BPM, that, that gets calculated later too. Excuse me, I have a step counter variable that's just for knowing which step we're on. Uh, the sequence length, I talked about uh, some variables for keeping track of the last step we were on and the current drum uh, that we're on, so that switches around between zero to 10 for my 11 different drum sounds. Uh, and then whether or not we're playing, so that's what gets changed when I press that little yellow button. Uh, I create my little digital read for that yellow button in the corner there. Maybe that should be another color, but I liked the yellow. Uh, and then I set up all my switch pins. These are the uh, KB2040 pins I'm using for all of those switches. And those are set up uh, as uh, using keypad. So actually the bouncer is only used, I think, for this yellow one and for this uh, rotary encoder switch. These are all using the keypad library, which I think just has the debouncing built in. Uh, set up all my LEDs, and those are using the, current, the constant current driver uh, of the AW9523. I went over that last week. Then uh, set up the rotary encoder to read the encoder uh, and the push encoder button. Uh, and then my MIDI setup, this varies if I'm using Adafruit MIDI or USB MIDI right now just during testing. It'll pick one of those or the other. Uh, and then I've got this variable here, actually this uh, list of drum names. And I've also got their correlated MIDI note. So this is based on that general MIDI thing I was talking about. You can just Google general MIDI drum note chart. Uh, and it'll tell you, okay, if you're doing an acoustic bass drum, it's going to be 35. If you're doing a sort of generic bass drum, which is the one that a lot of the electronic kits want to want to fire on, note 36. And so you can pick, pick your notes there for what you're going to do. Um, another feature I have not implemented, which is pretty typical for trying to emulate something like the 808 drum, is some of these have multiple tones. So the three toms can be three different congas, three different pitches of congas. Uh, there's a, the clave can also be a rim shot. The hand clap can be maracas. So uh, I didn't do that, but that's, that's an option you could you could add potentially. Uh, I've got a little function here called play note, or play drum rather, and then I feed it a note. Uh, which note are we, we playing? Uh, that comes from that list that I made earlier, so we know uh, based on the track that we're on which one to send. Uh, and then the way I'm sending it, if it's the MIDI, uh, if it's the Adafruit MIDI library, then it's midi.send note on the name of the note number and then a velocity. I'm using 120 or, uh, and then after it plays it on, it immediately turns it off uh, using note off and a velocity of zero. Uh, and then this is just the different uh, nomenclature or, or um, syntax. If you're doing the USB MIDI library, you construct your message first as a byte array. Uh, and this here is note on is X9, and then which channel it is is the next value. So zero through C or D or whatever it would be to get to 16. 
Uh, there are 16 MIDI channels on Earth. Uh, the note number and then the velocity. So it's very similar. Uh, you're just using this, uh, this hex nomenclature. And then note off is the uh, eight followed by the channel that you're sending it on. Uh, and then we write those two messages. Then we have a uh, little function here for lighting up the LEDs uh, as well. And as those are for steps that are held down versus the when it's playing. You can see the little blink running across there. Uh, set up my seven or rather 14 segment display here. Uh, I have a variable called edit modes. That's what I'm switching between for my BPM versus my track name or a drum voice name there. Uh, and then basically we start and you can see I'm fooling around with doing some uh, scrolling text. Uh, marquee I think just locks you out. It just never stops marqueeing but, but maybe there's something I, I need to do a little more cleverly. So I was going to marquee like the name of the drum machine on but that just it, it just went forever. So I got to figure out maybe using scroll. Let me just scroll it on and off and then get on with life. Uh, and then this is the main loop of the program. So in uh, this loop, uh, we check the start button, which is what I named this little yellow button here. If the uh, button has been pressed, so using uh, debouncer if it fell, then we change the state of the playing variable. Uh, and then we set the step counter at zero. So some drum machines will have a provision for sort of pausing. You essentially stop at the current beat and then restart there. I didn't want to do that. I'm just when I start, I'm restarting it at, uh, at the first step. Uh, we check for updates on the knob here, so uh, or rather the button of the knob, so knob button update, also using the bouncer. If it fell, we just switch that edit mode between the possible modes uh, and print the right stuff. And then this is the main if we're playing. Uh, so if we're playing, we do a check of the current time using supervisor ticks uh, underscore ms, so that's, that becomes this variable named now. And then if now minus the last step is greater than or equal to steps millis, then, and that's the subdivision based on our BPM, then it means it's time to advance to the next step. Uh, so we update that little variable last step to be now, so that this works over and over again. Uh, and then we send the light beat, uh, call the light beat function, which moves our little LED to the proper uh, next step. And then we check all of the drums and see, is there a, um, a note or not at the current step where we are in the sequence? Um, if it is, then we send the play note uh, to, to, to play that drum sound. I blew past this, I think, scrolling up. I sure did. This right here is how I'm storing my sequence. So since I just have the one sequence, I made it uh, kind of big and, and pretty to look at. It shows you the four beats and the um, four sixteenth notes per beat there. So we get our, our 16 uh, per track. So if we go scrolling back to the bass drum, you can see the first uh, beat of the first measure and then the first beat of the third measure and then the third beat of the third measure. So that's what that pattern, how that, how that ends up looking here. Um, so those are, those are the 11 possible drum tracks. So you'd have to change this if you decided to use different numbers uh, of drum voices. And then the last things that are happening here are switches. So this is using key, keypad library. So if the keypad library sees a switch uh, change, it's been pressed in this events gets, then we note down which of these 16 has been pressed. Uh, and then we set the, uh, essentially we flip the one and the zero that's visualized here. So if I were to press that, it's essentially saying, okay, that was a one, now it's a zero. So now we no longer play when we get there. And it, uh, it writes to this sequence, it updates the sequence, uh, sequence array or list. And so that's all that does. It just toggles the state saving that sequence. So now the next time it runs through to play, it'll, it'll do the right thing. Uh, and then we change the lighting as well. Uh, and then the last thing that happens is all of this uh, jazz with the rotary encoder. So we check the rotary encoder uh, position. Uh, actually invert it just because it was running counterclockwise. This one 
is set up that way. Um, so I want it to go in the other direction. So I've inverted it. If it's different than the last position it was on, that means it's changed. Uh, we set the encoder delta, uh, which is essentially going to be a either a one or uh, a negative one. So we're either moving up or down. Uh, if we're in edit mode, uh, zero, that's the BPM mode. And then if I make changes, I'm essentially updating the BPM value and I'm recalculating all of that stuff I need. Uh, and I could probably put that in its own function, but I, I didn't. Um, I'll, I'll probably have to before I get this thing uh, up on our GitHub or it'll yell at me for uh, global variables. Uh, update the display to uh, I clear it. So display fill zero just clears the display. And then I'm uh, writing. And, and the reason to do that is if you went from 100 down to 99, you'd leave the one behind if you don't clear it first. So it would go from 100 down to 199. Uh, if the edit mode is one, then that means we're changing the current drum to go between those different um, possible tracks. Uh, and then we're, we're updating all the lighting. So that's how we're able to show these different uh, patterns here that are stored in the sequence. Uh, and that is it. So, shoo, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for letting me talk through that. Uh, it'll help me, uh, talking through it helps me clean it up a bit and also uh, write up the, uh, the explanation in the guide. So that'll be, uh, that'll be coming. Um, and I think that does it for my project. So, let me know if you have any thoughts or questions about that uh, and anything else. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be looking in the Discord in a moment uh, to take any questions. The, uh, the last segment we got is new products. So uh, let's talk about what's going on in the store for new products. I'm going to go ahead and quickly update my um, browser here to the right one so I can look at new products. There we are. And here we go. New products. So uh, we have, I actually kind of theoretically have a bunch of these to show because I don't have the real ones. Uh, I, I think I will order a bunch of these to show you next week just so I can show you them hands on. But what I have are stand-ins for a bunch of these that I can show you. These are wiring connectors. These are not the ones that we're showing here, but these are wiring connectors, uh, and we have a few different types of these. So some of these I showed last week. Uh, some are new since last week. Uh, and there are essentially a, a, a few varieties of these. So this type that I have here and this type that I have here, these are snap connectors. Uh, these will join essentially one wire and send its signal along to many. So it is a, uh, a type of multiplier of just one wire. This will take one and send it out onto two others or, or join, the, join the circuit of, of uh, three wires together. Uh, this one does that with five. So usually you'll have you know, ground coming in and then you can send ground over to four things is, is a way to use those. Another type that we have are these pass-through ones with different conductors. So this would be useful for positive and ground, for example. Uh, and so you can see here on our snap action uh, three to three wiring block connector right here, this one allows you to run three wires through and connect them essentially like a splice without having to do any soldering, without using a wire nut or anything like that. Uh, this one is kind of more of a force multiplier, but for two different uh, signals. So you could put power and ground on this one coming in and then send out three power and ground each onto the other side. And so uh, the types we have are one-to-one -one wiring blocks, which look like this right here. And that's similar to something I have. Uh, this is a slightly different type, but these are great for just connecting one, one wire, uh, making, it, making it longer. You can see uh, nice little demo there of the uh, the one to ones, uh, and next to it there is the five to five. So you can see that in action there, running uh, five to five. Love the colors on these too. I've never seen them done in colors like this. Uh, and then here's one where we're spraying out one, and it becomes five. We also have the uh, three to three, and we have that two to six, and the biggest one of all, three to nine. So really useful if you're doing things with NeoPixels, let's say, and you want to run 
power, ground, and data uh, from one pin and just send three identical NeoPixel strips out, and they're going to get their power, ground, uh, and data signals off of those, uh, those now nine wires that started life as three. So uh, these are great looking. I can't wait to get my hands on them. These, uh, some of them also have a uh, mounting uh, point on them. So this one can be screwed down. You get a couple screws and screw it down to something. So really useful if you're doing uh, installations, uh, if you're doing burning many things, house lighting, uh, stage lighting, and so on. These are really, really cool uh, wired connectors. So yeah, you can see the two to six also has the mount points. Not found on, on, on these other ones like the three to three. Uh, one to five does have it. So any of them that kind of Y out uh, can get that that uh, connector there. So that is, uh, that's our full complement of, uh, I'm just going to go back to the new products page there. We can see them all at once. Full complement of wiring snap action blocks. Uh, this one here is a pretty similar uh, style. If I can show it right there, uh, you lift up, these are pretty, uh, pretty strong. So you lift up that connection poke a wire in there, and then snap that back down. So if you do that three times, you've now uh, multiplied your wire out to two others and connected them. Uh, so that uh, is one. Another uh, new product, you'll have to stop me. I can't remember. I think this one we had last week, but I'll mention it again, is the, uh, the MOSFET breakout. So this is a little MOSFET driver. has JST connector on one side to connect to your microcontroller, data pin, power, and ground. And then it has the uh, two... Uh, spring action uh, terminals for connecting your motor, your solenoid. Uh, it means you can now power off of a itty bitty weak little pin on your microcontroller and use the uh, transistor on there to be able to uh, drive a, a power hungry, current hungry device. So uh, you can check that out here. We also have the new learn guide from Liz that'll show you how to use it. Uh, and there's a nice close-up of it there. And here's the little back there, uh, again with our beautiful uh, silk or, or uh, silk screen text. Now it looks all nice. It's not all not all bumpy anymore. Uh, and this is a uh, diode protected, so you don't you don't have to worry about that collapsing electromagnetic field flyback causing your microcontroller to scream. Uh, this is this is protected by the diodes there, so uh, you can get uh, about amp and a half uh, out of that for constant current. Uh, not sure what the um, other specs on it there. Yeah, so this is your uh, yeah three to three to thirty volts you can provide, and the signal can be three to twenty volts at uh, logic level. And then you get the two terminal blocks to connect up your uh, power-hungry device. And then lastly, remember before when I said that our coupon code is blingy? Just like that, that'll get you 10% off in the store. And the reason is because I like the word blingy, and there it is right there. It's the new Feather S2. Neo Blingy RGB ESP32 S2 Feather Development Board from Unexpected Maker. Uh, so we just have a few of these in stock right now, but if you want to get one, uh, what you're getting is a, a really advanced board. It's Feather Form Factor, uh, pin compatible Feather Form Factor. It has the ESP32 S2 chip on it. It's got four megs of flash. It has two megs of QSPY uh, external PS RAM on it. It has this really cool little 5x5 five five NeoPixel uh, grid in the middle. Hmm, where have I seen that before? That reminds me of the product pick of the week this week. It was our little uh, cutie pie 5x5. Five five. So you get a nice little 5x5 um, five five matrix there for doing blingy, blingy things. You can obviously write words on there, which is useful. Simple little uh, text readout. Uh, and this being ESP32 S2, you can do Wi-Fi with it. So you can use this as an IoT uh, type of device connected up to Adafruit I.O. or other IoT types of uses. Um, it runs a, uh, let me see, it runs latest version, yeah, latest version of CircuitPython that supports ESP32 S2. Um, also runs uh, on the ESP IDF and the Arduino uh, support as well if you want to 
code in uh, C++. Uh, what else? There was another cool feature on this. It's got, uh, oh, the RGB LED that's used for um, status can be shut down to reduce your deep sleep current. Uh, and also has a pretty beefy 700 milliamp uh, regulator for 3.3 volt. And uh, the, uh, by the way, the um, matrix, LED matrix there is uh, running on its own LDO. So that current is not going to affect, you're not going to brown out your, your logic current on the rest of the board there. So um, really smart design behind here. So go check that out. That, uh, let's, let's take a look at some of these nice pictures here. Uh, it's got USB-C on it. It has the battery charging circuit uh, and JST connectors for LiPo that you know and love. Uh, it has uh, boot and reset buttons on it for uh, getting into, for resetting it and for getting into uh, flashing mode. And it has a uh, Stemma QT quick connector on it for connecting up your I2C devices. Comes with some header pins there. Depending on how you want to use it, you could solder those on. Happy, happy USB-C. Uh, and there's the back of the board there. Make something unexpected. It's the Feather Neo S2 from unexpectedmaker.com. Uh, and you can go to unexpectedmaker.com. There's a link here uh, for documentation and support. Uh, and you can go to circuitpython.org to uh, grab your, uh, your UF2 to, to um, flash this with the latest version uh, and check out what versions are available. Check out the notes there. Uh, and, oh, that first pick has a nice animation. Why isn't it animating for me? Is that the one you were talking about, Australy? Don't know why it's not animating. Spooky. Uh, all right, well, that, I think, is going to do it for new products. No, 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 no. All right, uh, so let's take a look at the Discord. What kind of thoughts, questions, comments do you have? And then we'll wrap this up. I know this has gone kind of long. Um, I feel like Phil and Lamore get this done quicker. I'm taking my time with it somehow. Click it. He says click it. All right, let's click it. It has decided not to let me click it. Maybe it's the browser I'm in. Don't know why. Yeah, it says loop. It, it looks like it's got the video controls of one of our animated GIFs. I don't know what happened to mine. Oh, let me reload it. Hey, that worked. Just a simple reload. Let me go back to that page real quick. All right, watch. I'm going to reload. <laughs> we'll see if it plays. It's playing. It's playing. Stopped. Stop. I don't know what's going on. Uh, got mad at me. All right. So, uh, yeah, questions. Let me know your questions here. I'm going to skim back a bit and I'll look for any. Uh, if you put my at JP name in, it will uh, alert me and it'll be easier for me to see. Um, so, going back a little ways. Um, Loving this seven segment or 14 segment display, trying to do lowercase. What library are you using to do those letters? Uh, that is the, uh, I think it's just the HT33K, HT1633K library has, the, has that, um, that font built into it. So all of that lowercase stuff came from there. Uh, Jordy Gee says, I'm thinking NeoKey 5 by 6 Oh, that's something else you're building. Okay, maybe not, maybe not the drone project. Um, some love for GarageBand. Yeah, that Brooklyn drum kit is good, huh? Uh, Todd says it's remarkable on iPad. People want to get their gels. Let me move this over here so I'm not looking off to the side. Oh, does that break it? Nope, it, it found it. Uh, Ashley says, Tap Plastics has some of the color smoky and reflective plastic film by the foot. Oh, that's good to know. And by the way, uh, I think someone might have been talking about um, Pixelsmith says, iOS 
bought a third party program that allows you to chain apps as sound sources, effects, recording, syncs with no latency. It's built into the OS now. Yeah, I think this is, uh, oh, I can't even remember the names anymore. Uh, it's not Audio Kit, but uh, Audio Units. I think it's Audio Units. But yeah, on an iPad, you can have like multiple apps that are uh, at a very fundamental low level in the operating system communicating with each other. So you get low, low, low latency and the ability to run something into an effect or have a drum kit that's its own thing. It's, it's pretty impressive. I haven't dived much into that, but there's a lot you can do. Um, C. Grover has a link to something that's worked well for, uh, I think, a filter uh, sample book for LED projects. Go check that link in our Discord if you're interested. Uh, someone almost put their eye out while soldering. That's no good. Wear your goggles. Um, bum, bum, bum. Is there an iSpy cable splice extender? Uh, oh, not that I'm aware of. I don't know if I've seen any. You could probably build, build that. It'd just be tiny you'd probably have to drag solder it, but I think you could get the little uh, connectors we're using for those and just uh, make a make a splicey board for that. Uh, yeah, FPC, thank you. Uh, Liz says, look for FPC extenders for that. Uh, Australi shows, has been DJing with, are those, those, uh, are those light up goggles? Everything about that is pretty spectacular. Actually, I'll have to check that out later. Uh, first pick up nice animation. Okay, we're caught up, almost. Uh, okay, questions. So, oh, Liz always asking the fun ones. If you were to design a Eurorack module, what type of module would you design? Hmm. Let me think about that and come back to it. I'm, I'm gonna thinking while I look at other ones. Uh, are the switches for your MIDI controller momentary contact? I want to make a budget version. Uh, these are uh, momentary switches, yeah. So you could, you could get um, any tactile switches, any momentary tactile switches, and use them in this, in this kind of way. Um, you could even probably dig open an old keyboard, like a keyboard. Bigger would be better with more space. This is still working, by the way. I know I said I was going to replace it because of the battery, but it's still working. Uh, if there's a fire, you know why. But you, you might be able to, to use an old keyboard uh, and rewire it or tap into the, the matrix on it. But yeah, tactile switches on a, uh, momentary tactile switches on a breadboard will work for, for what I'm doing there. Uh, you'd, you'd, if you wanted LEDs, you'd wire those separately. Um, got a cool matrix GIF. Okay, so coming back to this, designing a Eurorack module. Um, I like the notion of um, clock input and clock divider. I know I actually mentioned um, the, uh, one of my favorite modules is a clock one the other, the other week, but uh, based on, uh, I showed that one, the little trinket trigger that Todd had made. I like the idea of using something that's got a, uh, maybe a circuit Python uh, or Arduino microcontroller on it that's programmable to uh, set up interesting um, clock division, so feed it or tap a tempo into it, but have it be able to send off, you know, different uh, subdivisions of, of clock multiplications and divisions of clock based on that so that it's streamlined, so there's no, no menu, no UI. I uh, also really like the idea of a multiple LFO. Uh, so have, have something that's got multiple outputs uh, and maybe knobs to say I've got one main low frequency output, and then I can use knobs to have everything else be related ones to that so that we get one that's halves and one that's twice as long. But having a lot of modulation sources that are based on one uh, but tunable would be a lot of, a lot of fun. So cool question. Uh, all right, I think that's gonna do it for today. Thanks everyone for hanging out. Thanks for your questions. Uh, let me see. I. I Let's see if there was any questions over on YouTube, too. Uh, Trader Monk asked, uh, I'm not a programmer, but I have ideas of stuff I want to do, so I'm thinking about trying to learn this. I'm kind of clueless of where to start. Uh, I always recommend check out uh, Make Code, and you can go to Adafruit's learn, uh, learn.adafruit.com and check out a couple of uh, beginner guides on Make Code. 
um, because it is about the logic of programming and not about the typing, the little syntax. Uh, and then you can use it to pivot over into, uh, I think, JavaScript and Python on it, or come on over to CircuitPython, which uh, once you've got some ideas of how the logic of, of programming these things work, uh, you might want to check out CircuitPython because it's very friendly, uh, and we have a lot of great tutorials for absolute beginners. So those would be my recommendations to, uh, to Trader Monk. Uh, oh, yeah, nice... Uh, Australia posted, there's a, there's a good uh, party platter of tactile switches. If you're thinking of, of uh, having a bunch of tactile switches on hand, check out some of those links there. Um, and that is going to do it. I will be back next week with a product pick of the week on Tuesday. And I will uh, do this show on Wednesday, and then I think a lot of people will be taking some time off for the holidays, so I'll, I'll see you sometime after that. Um, but in closing, I'll say thank you so much for stopping by. For Adafruit Industries, I'm John Park. This has been John Park's workshop, and now your moment of Zorba.